Hi everyone and welcome to church. No, don't change the channel. You've come to the right place for All Saints Anglican Nowra. But today we're going to start our service up in our little Nerega church. I happen to be up here during the week on a pastoral matter and I thought maybe we'd all appreciate a change of scenery. So we're going to start at Nerega and on the way home we're going to drop in at some members places and then we're going to finish our service at All Saints Nowra in our Nowra building. Why don't you come inside? So this is the little Nerega building and we hold a service out here once a month and the faithful gather from uh, tracks down through the bush and some people who grew up here come up from Nowra just for this service. And yet you can see some blankets on the pews. We don't have air conditioning or even electricity in this church. So you have to rug up when you come to Nerega. Let's pray as we begin our service. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us together in this unique way. And we pray this morning for having opened your word, that we would be encouraged and we would grow in our faith and our dependence on you. And Lord, we think of the tragedies in the world, especially of Afghanistan and Kabul, this last week and we pray that you would help us to be generous and mindful of your world and those who are suffering and we pray this in Jesus name Amen well about this time last year our musicians got together and they produced this piece so that we could sing in our homes so whether you're a home singer or uh, you prefer to sit quietly, please don't skip this part. Please lift your hearts to God in worship. joy 
as we prayed, the great tragedy of this week is the fall of Kabul in Afghanistan to the Taliban. And so we're going to pray now for those who have been left in this ravage of war. And Scott McLaren, who has served in the Middle East, is going to lead us in prayer. Let's bow our heads and pray. Almighty God, creator and preserver of our world, we pray today for peace. Have mercy on our broken and divided world and banish the spirits that makes for war. We ask that leaders of nations and governments will pursue freedom, justice and welfare of all people. We pray especially for all affected by the escalating turmoil and tragic events in Afghanistan. Help the leaders of nations to protect the vulnerable and to establish justice and peace. Restrain the forces of evil and protect men, women and children from encroaching Taliban forces. We also pray for the Christians living in Afghanistan. Preserve their lives and strengthen their witnesses in this land of deep spiritual darkness and despair. And we pray too for the veterans of our Defence Force. Sustain these men and women who have served our country. May they receive the care and support they need at this time of disappointment and discouragement. Heavenly Father, in an uncertain world, please turn your hearts of all people to your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and to peace that passes all understanding. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to continue praying and Kate and Bowden are going to lead us and they're standing outside their home out at Falls Creek. Father, we come before you with aching hearts. Father, we live in this beautiful world, but it is damaged by our sin and we need you. The coronavirus is spreading so quickly, so far and wide. Please contain the virus, give your wisdom, energy and perseverance to the testing and contact tracing teams, our leaders making decisions that have such a huge impact on our community. We especially pray for our leaders at this time, Scott Morrison, our Prime Minister, and Gladys Berejikli and our Health Minister Brad Hazard and Chief Health Officer Kerry Chant. Please also protect our workers in essential services, teachers, police, those in aged care, Doctors, nurses, paramedics, retail workers, so many roles, Lord. Uphold them when their spirits and energy levels lag and anxiety rises. Where there are Christians in these roles, may they be your instruments of peace, showing constant love and kindness, ever ready to give a reason for the hope they have in you. We pray for those who are fearful, those living in abusive relationships or with serious financial challenges, those who are lonely, isolated, sick or in pain or grief. By your presence, protection and provision, please bring them your peace. Psalm 73 reminds us, Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Father, we pray for those nations, especially our new neighbours like Indonesia, Fiji and Papua New Guinea, where the coronavirus is running rampant and the distribution of aid is impeded by inadequate healthcare systems, corruption and lack of resources. May wealthy nations like ours be generous in sharing with those who are poor. May we be generous to others in need. We pray for our parishes and churches at this time. Lord, you said, I will build my church. We ask you, Lord, to fulfill your promise, even in the COVID season. May our parishes and churches grow and be strengthened at this difficult time. We know more Australians are thinking about the meaning of life than was the case before COVID and more are turning to prayer. Lord, help them to find the living hope of the Lord Jesus at this time. We pray for our diocesan organisations at this time and we remember YouthWorks and Anglicare. For YouthWorks we pray as presently SRE in schools and Christian camps for schools and churches cannot meet. Please Lord, bring an easing in restrictions so these important ministries can resume. For Anglicare, we thank you that our chaplains in hospitals, prisons and aged care are still working and can care and support patients, inmates, residents and staff while family visits are not permitted. 
at this COVID time, may your love, care, hope and peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be shared with all those in need. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. In a moment, we're going to open God's Word. But before we do, Kaz has prepared a little family moment for us. Hey, all saints! I'm Kaz. I'm Heidi. I'm Emily. This is your best. Hi, Jeter. This is your bestie. <laughs> Remember it? Yeah. We are only in lockdown for one week. But we thought we would get away with it for a little longer. But here we are. How is everyone feeling? Have you signed down? Are you in protest? Feeling chill? Are you freaking out yet? Okay, there's no one out, but make sure you try and get off your devices, go outside, get some exercise. If you're feeling angry and trying to protest, maybe think of God. And while you're thinking of God, you could also think of trying to talk to an adult about anything that's going on. And maybe a bit of self-control. You're chilling, that's good, but don't chill too much. Get up and help around the house and church. And if you're freaking out, why don't you pray and talk to God? Whenever things go to poop, it's good to check in with God. So you have self-control by praying. Wait, what's self-control? Definition is someone who controls over his or her own impulses, emotions, actions. I spent my limit. That's it, I'm done. They just want to go outside and go and play, but they can't because we've got to listen to the authorities and more importantly, we've got to listen to God and obey Him. It's also a good idea to check in with each other. Just like Paul the Apostle did when Timothy was in a rough time. He wrote letters to people to encourage them in faith. This in ancient form, people used to do a hundred years ago. So Paul, he wrote encouragements to Christians about sanctification, justification, fruit of the spirit, grace, and morale. Isn't self-control one of the fruits of the spirit? Yep, it is a fruit of the spirit. Just like in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, in the Bible where Paul writes to his friend to encourage him in the church, you guys are looking at me like you don't know. Do you know it? Not really. Oh, well, let's check out this video. This is the same Paul that we have talked about before. Remember that Paul started out as a man who hated anyone who followed Jesus and had them thrown in prison. But God stopped Paul one day and spoke to him. Paul became a believer in Jesus and started telling everyone about Jesus. Soon, it was Paul that was imprisoned because of his teaching about Jesus. Paul had a helper, a young man named Timothy. Paul wrote letters of instruction and encouragement to Timothy, and we still have two of them in our Bibles today, known as the books of 1st and 2nd Timothy. In his letters, Paul told Timothy that he thanked God for him and that he prayed for him every day. He longed to see Timothy again, whom he loved like a son. You see, the only family for Timothy mentioned in the Bible is his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice. But it was these special adults that first taught Timothy about God and belief in Jesus. And Paul urged Timothy to continue to be strong in his faith that he first learned from them. Paul reminded Timothy to remember all the teaching about Jesus. And even better, Paul, who was writing while he was in a jail cell, told Timothy he was not ashamed to be in jail for his belief in teaching about Jesus. He encouraged Timothy to be strong in his faith. He shouldn't fear, because the same God that is helping Paul will also help Timothy. Some of Paul's final words to Timothy are instructions to continue in what he learned when he asked his mother and grandmother. Young Timothy came to belief in Jesus and studied the wisdom of the scriptures alongside Paul. It is the scripture, the Bible, that will make him ready for every good work that God needed him to do. Maybe you could pray about 
someone you want to write to in the All Saints community. You could hop onto Elvanto and pick someone to write to and also update your details. Paul also depended on his friends to help deliver the letters. Thanks, that's it from all of us today. See ya! Our first reading comes from Job 31, 1 through to 8. And it's Job we're hearing. I made a covenant with my eyes, not to look lustfully at a girl. For what is man's lot from God above, his heritage from the Almighty on high? Is it not for the wicked, disaster for those who do wrong? Does he not see my ways and count my every step? If I have walked in falsehood, or my foot has hurried after deceit, let God weigh me in honest scales, so that I am blameless. If my steps have turned from the path, if my heart has been led by my eyes, or my hands have been defiled, then may others eat what I have sown, and may my crops be uprooted. This reading is from Job chapter 32, verses 1 to 9. So these three men stopped answering Job, because he was righteous in his own eyes. But Elihu, son of Barakel the Buzite, of the family of Ram, became very angry with Job for justifying himself rather than God. He was also angry with the three friends, because they had found no way to refute Job, and yet had condemned him. Now Elihu had waited before speaking to Job, because they were older than he. But when he saw that the three men had nothing more to say, his anger was aroused. So Elihu, son of Barakel the Buzite, said, I am young in years, and you are old. That is why I was fearful, not daring to tell you what I know. I thought, age should speak, advanced years should teach wisdom. But it is the spirit in a man, the breath of the Almighty, that gives him understanding. It is not only the old who are wise, not only the aged who understand what is right. If Job was a courtroom drama, and in many respects it is, then we're now in the final act. Not the final scene, that's next week when God shows up. Now remember that Job doesn't have a lawyer, that's part of his problem. He's acting as his own defence counsel as he prosecutes God as he accuses God of gross negligence, of not doing his job properly, of unfairness. And we may feel that Job might just have a case. And if Job wins his case, then that might open God up to a class action suit. Well, in 27 chapters, Job's pals have thrown everything at him, trying to find out his secret sin, but they can't land a glove on him. Then in chapter 28, the narrator steps forward and calls a kind of recess in this court hearing. And he makes a profound account of man's pursuit for wealth, but never quite discovering the most valuable jewel of all. God's wisdom. A hint to the wisdom as an answer in the last chapters. And uh, the narrator finally says the beginning of wisdom is respect and awe for God and shunning evil. The very things we know that Job has done till now. Well, now in chapters 29 to 31, Job delivers his great, I rest my case moment. But just like in the movies, someone bursts into the courtroom. Enter Elihu, the fourth friend. And he says, wait, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I demand to be heard in the trial of Job versus God. I must testify. I have new evidence. And when you hear this evidence, you will throw this man, Job, out of court. So we all think, ah, what's this new evidence he's going to bring? But before we hear from Elihu, let's hear Job sum up and justify himself and by implication, charge God. 
In chapter 29, he begins by drawing the jury's sympathy with a heartfelt story as he reflects on the good times. So in verse 1 of chapter 29, How I long for the old days when I enjoyed God and knew his blessing. And he describes his status in verse 7 when he was the most respected man at the gate. Back in the day, he wore the robe and turban of justice. People came to him for justice. But now, in chapter 30, he says, in verse 1, They mock me. Verse 9, they write cruel songs about me. All is reversed. And so he makes his final appeal. God, you must weigh my heart. Weighing the heart was an ancient Middle Eastern idea. The Egyptians believed that the heart recorded all the good things and bad things that you'd done in your life, kind of like the hard drive of a computer. And after death, the heart was weighed against the feather of Ma'at, the goddess of truth and justice. So Job is saying God must weigh his heart and his heart will prove his innocence. It will be as light as a feather. Job says, long ago, I made a covenant with my eyes, never to look lustfully with a woman, because I know that the Almighty sees everything. Job understood the deep connection between feeding his heart through his eyes. Doesn't that sound like Jesus in Matthew 5? If man looks on woman with lust, he commits adultery in the heart. I wonder if we really live as though God is looking at our hearts and whether we guard our hearts from being corrupted by the the cameras of our eyes. I'm not just talking about pornography, but the greed for more and more things that come to to us through magazines and and catalogues. Job is saying, I made a heart covenant to walk before you, God, with integrity. And then Job names 10 things that he dares God to weigh on his scales. And each one begins with, if I. So verses 5 to 8. If I have been led by a dishonest heart in my dealings. If I am guilty of adultery. If I have exploited my employees, if I have withheld from the needy, if I have denied justice to the defenceless, if I have trusted in wealth, if I have worshipped idols, if I have gloated over my enemies' misfortunes, if I've failed in hospitality, if I've been a hypocrite. So it comes all the way back to the heart itself. Reality check. Job's not suffering because of sin but his suffering is now causing him to sin he's accusing God he's justifying himself now Job might be coming just a little bit tedious to us ranting around trying to prove that he is righteous and God is unjust we say we'd never carry on like that but might we our frustration with Job is because we've seen behind the curtain and we know the backstory and we know the outcome. He's exhausted. We need to be sympathetic towards Job as he stands in these shadow lands. He's lost his sense of direction. Job is standing right at the place where so many people reject God. People who've said, I can no longer believe in a God that allows evil and injustice for children to suffer. It's the same place that many Christians have stood and walked away from their faith. I can't believe God would let this happen to me after I've been a faithful Christian for so many years. It's the place from where the most irrational response to God springs. I'm too angry with God to believe in him. Angry with the one that we don't believe in. I've watched, and I bet you've watched, friends walk away from Jesus when they stood in this difficult place. 
To stand there sure-footed takes incredible courage and confidence that God has higher purposes in the greater view of history that we can't possibly see from where we stand, our place in the storm. On those days, we do well to remember that God has stood there first. Remember that God the Father watched the Son crucified. At the cross, in that place, Jew, Greek, Roman and the disciples, it didn't make sense to them. In that place, God seemed silent. God had abandoned. God was unjust. How could the death of the Son of God have any purpose and meaning? And yet it did. God the Father has stood in that place. God the Father knows every inch of that dark place too. All this week, uh, surfers around the world have been watching over and over again some footage of possibly the heaviest wave ever ridden. And it took place in Tahiti at a reef called Chaupo. And Chaupo conjures up fear and respect in every surfer. It's a wave that stands straight up out of the Pacific Ocean and draws over a shallow reef, turning itself inside out before it explodes. Now watch these two rides that took place this week. To watch the first surfer tells you how fragile the man and how tentative his place on the wave. Uh, there is only one line that he can hold to to make that wave. It's a brutal wave and he loses his line and he gets slammed, goes over the falls. But watch the second man. He's just as fragile, but he's sure-footed in what he's doing. And he holds to the only line that can take him through that mountain of water that is dragging across the reef before he disappears into that big blue cavern. And then he's spat out with an explosion of spray. He makes it. And I want to say, when tragedy arrives, you need to be already sure-footed in God and hold to that one and only line that can take you safely through. What do I mean by that? Well, sitting out the back in the lineup of Chiao Po is not the time or place to decide you better learn how to surf. You need to have invested in that idea a long time ago. And when a wave of tragedy fills the horizon of your life, this is not the time to start working out your theology of who God is in your suffering. You needed to have invested in that a lot earlier. This isn't the time to go back for those old Sunday school pictures of Jesus you once coloured in. You need a bigger picture of God. We need to hold a bigger picture of who God is rather than simply the Sunday school image of Jesus in the manger. The picture we must hold must be of an expansive view of the cross. You know, the, these two surfers hold another idea. See, the first surfer gets only so far. We might even say he was blameless and upright in the challenge. He starts courageously, but he loses his way and he loses his line and he loses his footing. And he's lost. But the second man, also blameless and upright, and sure-footed, holds the line. And although he's swallowed up in the jaws of that horrendous wave, he miraculously emerges. In this, Job is the first man. He's righteous and trusts his heavenly father to a point, but in the end he falters. But Jesus is like the second man. He is righteous and trusts his father even into death. And he emerges from death victoriously. 
The book of Job holds out this incredible comparison between Job and Jesus. Jesus emerges victoriously for us. Jesus is our righteousness. But let's get back to Job. He's ranting and making speeches about the injustice of God. He's acting as his own defence counsel, justifying himself and prosecuting God. And then he sits down and says, I rest my case. But as we've said before the final verdict, Elihu presses into the room and says, wait a minute, Job. And Elihu's four speeches are very, very sharp. We don't have time to tease them out idea by idea. However, if we read his intro carefully, we can see that he's taking up the role of a prophet. He's preparing the way for God's voice. He says that he's held back till now because he's younger and needed to respect the wisdom of his elders. But in the end, his elders brought no wisdom. Chapters 32, 6 to 13. Only worldly speculation. But chapter 33, verse 4. The Spirit of the Almighty has made me to speak. And the difference that we should see between Elihu and his three friends is that the three friends tried to blame Job as the problem, some evil that he's being punished for. Elihu doesn't follow them in that speculation. He appeals instead to the character of God. Do we understand the character of God? Look at what he says in 33, 8 to 12. He's saying that you say, Job, that you're being treated unfairly and that God doesn't answer. But verse 12, I tell you, in this you are not right, for God is greater than man. Why do you complain to him that he answers none of man's words? For God does speak. Now in one way, now in another, though man may not perceive it. And Elihu goes on to say what some of those ways in which God speaks. And in 34 verse 12, As for the charge that God denies you justice, Job, it is unthinkable that God would do wrong, that the Almighty would pervert justice. And he puts the implications of Job's accusation another way. He says, Do you think that God is just the work experience boy put there by someone else who he probably doesn't really know what he's doing? Maybe there's someone greater and wiser over him, do you think? Verse 13. Who appointed him over the earth? Who put him in charge of the whole world? Nobody. Verse 14 to 15. If it were his intention... And he withdrew his spirit and breath. All mankind would perish together and man would return to dust. No, Job, God is omniscient. He knows everything. God is omnipotent. He is all powerful. God is omnipresent. That is, he is everywhere at all times. He is the wisdom that drew all of creation together. Can you see what Elihu is doing? He's giving Job a cup of perspective of who God is. God is in command. He's not like a man who makes mistakes, Job. Job, you've, you've misfired in your logic. Elihu is the first speaker to remind Job of who God is, even when life doesn't make sense. God is still the eternal, all-powerful, incorruptible, wise, impassable God. It's a 101 in philosophy class that when you use the word God, by definition, you mean all these things. God does not have to come running when he's summoned accused by men who lack wisdom. Elihu is saying to Job, your picture of God is too small. In your pain and all your disappointments, you've shrunk God down to your size. And a God your size 
cannot rescue you. A God your size is no better than you. We all need to hear the voice of Elihu. God is very patient with us in our suffering, but it will not do to finally shrink God down to our size. At the end of chapter 37, Elihu paints a picture of a storm. He describes the God who can spin a cyclone on his finger. It's quite beautiful. Let me read to you from uh, chapter 37, verses 1 to 9. At this my heart pounds and leaps from its place. Listen, listen to the roar of his voice, to the rumbling that comes from his mouth. He unleashes his lightning beneath the whole heaven and sends it to the ends of the earth. After that comes the sound of his roar. He thunders with majestic voice. When his voice resounds, he holds nothing back. God's voice thunders in marvellous ways. He does great things beyond our understanding. He says to the snow, fall on the earth, and to the rain shower, be a mighty downpour. So that all men he has made may know his work. He stops every man from his labour. The animals take cover. They remain in their dens. The tempest comes out of its chamber. The cold from the driving winds. Elihu asks Job to slow down and consider whether he can really pitch his wisdom against the God whose knowledge and wisdom wrote the laws of physics and meteorology and drew all of creation together around that wisdom. Job, might God just know what he's doing? Might have greater purpose? Verse 14, listen to this, Job, and stop and consider God's wonders. Do you know how God controls the clouds and makes his lightning flash? Do you know how the clouds hang poised? Those wonders of him who is perfect in knowledge. At the end of his colourful description of the storm, so vivid that we feel like we're standing in a storm, and remember that Job's whole life has become like a storm, Elihu then describes the storm passing and the sky clearing and the sun appearing after the wind and rain has swept clean the sky. And Elihu finishes with these words. Now no one can look at the sun, bright as it is in the skies, after the wind has swept them clean. Out of the north he comes in golden splendour. God comes in awesome majesty. The Almighty is beyond our reach and exalted in power. In his justice and great righteousness he does not oppress. Therefore men revere him. For does he not have regard for all the wise in heart. God is listening to those who are practicing true wisdom to respect God and shun evil. And if we were to read into next week's passage, we would read, Then the Lord answered Job out of the storm. Wow, I look forward to it. Job is going to get what he longs for, God shows up and God is going to speak. And Elihu has been preparing Job for it. In suffering, the world closes in and God seems small and silent. And the problem is that we've often shrunk God down to our size so that we can complain to him, so that we can accuse him. And then we wonder why we can't trust him. It's especially in those times we need the big picture of God, a great God who knows why. We may not get to know why, but we can get to know the God who knows why. And back to Nara. Hope you've enjoyed joining us this morning as uh, we've been all around our big wide parish from Nerega uh, down to the, the base, the naval base, and then to uh, Falls Creek, Bomaderry, North Nara, 
and here we are in church. Yeah, we do have a big, wide parish and a diverse bunch of people that God has made one in Christ. Dig deep into God this week, all saints. And uh, we've just learned that the numbers today are 830, so we suspect we will be in lockdown next Sunday, so we're going to meet together in this format again. But have a good week, press on and dig into God.